I feel like I have this this prayer that I wanted to say before we got started, but I think Michael took care of all that already. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I want to talk about imagination just for a moment because imagination <clears throat> has a bad rap in the Christian community. A very bad rap. And Michael is exactly right through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> um, can't hear me? You want to eat it up a little bit, Tim? Please. <clears throat> can't hear me? Thank you. I sound very loud to me. Yeah, we need you loud. <clears throat> Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And some people have caused this, thought this to mean imagination's not of God. So if you have an imagination, something pops into your head. It's like, oh, that can't be God. See, there's even a Bible verse. We're supposed to cast it down. It doesn't say that. The problem is not our imagination because, you know, everything that we have, God gave us. But the enemy takes it and perverts it. And the issue is when people take what they hear from God and they per then their imagination becomes perverted. So when they hear of the riches of God, they immediately want to go buy a go buy a house down in the lake and spend two million dollars. Well, that's a perversion of the imagination of God. Because maybe you did see a mansion on the water, but maybe it was in the spirit. And we took it to be a natural thing, and all of a sudden it becomes something, and it becomes really a, almost a vain imagination is what I like to say. I would actually retranslate to say, cast on every vain imagination that it's all excel against the knowledge of God. So, I would never have spoken of this, but since it came out prophetically, <laughs> that sure looked like an opening to me. So we could talk about it just a moment. Because God wants us to imagine. I mean, is there anybody here that's ever imagined walking on water? Anybody? How about flying? Yeah. Flying? Flying is, is a good one. Flying. <clears throat> How about uh, walking by people and having your shadow heal people? Mm -hmm. about that Anybody? One. Yes, let's go. Ahead. Yes. <clears throat> How about realizing that there's a need in Africa or Colombia and feeling like you need to be there and all of a sudden you're there? These are the kinds of imaginations. We need this imagination. <clears throat> and the truth is that <clears throat> a lot of times when we hear something and we think it's our imagination, it's the spirit that is giving us that. Because the only limitations that God has are the ones that we put upon Him. Right? I mean, <clears throat> I remember the first time I shared in front of an open group, it was about 30 years ago. And, and the word that I had was about God in the box. Like check in the box. And, you know, there was a time when the presence of the Lord was in a box. And right now, there is a box that the presence of the Lord lives in and it's, it's right here. Right here is the box. Hallelujah. This it may seem very disjointed. I, I, will, I will tell you that um, even with my wife, there were some things the Lord told me and I was told I could not share it before we got here. <clears throat> I was in the shower this morning and, the Lord, and I was speaking to the Lord and I said, I hope I do good today. The Lord said, well, you're going to do terrible. <laughs> he said, but I'm going to be great. <laughs> yes, Lord. <laughs> and I was not allowed to prepare for this morning. He wouldn't let me study. He said, if you study, then it'll be of you. If you just get up and share the word that I've given you to share with the body, it'll be me. He said, I don't want you to study. I don't want you to prepare. I just want you to go up and share the word that I've given you to give to the body of Christ. He said, you've been waiting 30 years for this. And now is the time. This is the time to deliver that message. And that message is, God's not coming the way we think. And I said, well, gee, Lord, I'm not a teacher or a preacher. And he said, I want you to do neither. I don't want you to teach and I don't want you to preach. He said, I want you to share about the revelation that I've shared with you. 
You know, the scripture says that he came unto his own. This is really annoying me. Okay, move it. <laughs> I really hate the accoutrements of all this. I hate the podium and, and the microphone. It's like I'd rather use the handheld. I got over there and I read, mom said, you have to wear the microphone today. And it's like, do I have to? She said yes. So I've got it on. You'll, you'll find about me, I don't like podiums, I don't like microphones, I don't like titles. I've always eschewed all of that. I don't want any of it. And <clears throat> there is a purpose and a reason for that with some people in the body of Christ. It's necessary and the Lord has ordained it to be that way, but it, it's not so with me. <laughs> What's that? I said I love microphones. It, <laughs> it helps us hear. Yeah. Yeah. We well, can't I, uh, we can't hear. I taught fourth grade swim program in a pool. Trust me, I can project. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, we were going to a ballet, a Christian ballet on Friday night, and I had been praying. Said, "Lord, you still haven't given me a thing to share. It's, it's a day and a half away." And He said, "You're in good shape." And then Laura said, "Isn't that a beautiful church?" And I said, well, yes, it is. And then all of a sudden into my mind came the image of John the Baptist, who's the antithesis of that. You've got this crazy guy out in the wilderness. His hair must have been, you know, looked like he, he was in dreads or he hadn't cut his hair probably his entire life. He was wearing a, a camel hair clothes tied around his waist with a piece of leather, and he was eating locusts and honey. He was in the wilderness. I mean, this guy looked like the wild man from Borneo. You know, he looked like he was completely uncivilized and, was the act, and he was the exact antithesis of what was embodied by the scribes and the Pharisees and the hierarchy of the Jewish religion of its day. And this is what God chose to be the herald, to be the person that it would announce the coming of Christ. And he was in the wilderness. And he was crazy. And this guy, John the Baptist, had some, not nice, had some not such nice things to say to the scribes and Pharisees when they came to see him. Um, this is Matthew 3, and maybe I will take a look at this, since the Lord is telling me to read this. Good. <clears throat> Matthew 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, I know where it is. <laughs> But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring therefore fruit and meat for repentance, etc., etc. Here is this strong rebuke of this man of God who had seen the coming of the kingdom and he didn't have anything nice to say to the religious order of the day. You know, Jesus came unto his own and his own knew him not. And they knew him not because he didn't come the way that everybody thought he was coming. He was supposed to be coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He was supposed to be coming on a white horse with soldiers and a golden spear. And he was supposed to conquer the Romans and bring in the kingdom of heaven right on earth. And then Jesus went on to say, my kingdom is not of this earth. He said, my kingdom's in heaven. And so because Jesus didn't present himself the way everybody was looking, they missed him. All of the learned people of the day, all the scribes and the Pharisees, all the religious order, they all missed him. With, a few, with some notable exceptions, of course. Nicodemus in the night. <clears throat> but John the Baptist didn't miss it. He knew. And that's because he spent his time in the wilderness. There is a time and a season where it is good. And I don't, I don't want to come off as sounding like I'm anti going to church. I'm completely not. I think that the Lord calls us into the place that we go. And you should stay there until the Lord calls you out. And I will tell you that in the Bible, 
some of the most significant encounters in the New Testament that people had with the Father were in the wilderness. And John the Baptist is only the first one of those. Another notable one is, of course, Paul, who went to Arabia, which is basically out in the desert wilderness. Now, we don't know exactly how much time he spent in the wilderness. We do know that he spent three years somehow there before he re-engaged with the apostles. That's all we really know. But he didn't do the first thing that he did when he had this encounter with the Lord. Is he didn't, is he went into the wilderness. That's where he went. And there the Lord revealed things to him. And taught him about all the scriptures that he thought he knew. Of course, because Paul was very educated in the ways of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he said, you know, he, and yet he said, I come not to you with wisdom and man's words. He said, but in power of the Holy Ghost. And he just said, I count all of this as dung compared to the knowledge and the excellency of Christ. I th hope that's the thing that we're hoping for, is that we have this incredible revelation that we receive and we'll get it in the wilderness. Of course, the most notable person in the New Testament that spent his time in the wilderness in this was none other than Jesus. You know, scriptures say that he would often get away from his apostles and go out into the wilderness to spend time with the Lord. I think it's very common for Christians to say, how do I walk more in the Spirit? How do I hear more from God? How do I learn this walk? People will walk up to me and say, how do you see so much? How do you know so much? And I think it's because I never had any bad habits to unlearn. When I uh, grew up, I was Catholic. And the Catholic doctrine, even at 17, was so absurd to me, I rejected it all. And for a while, I was an atheist. I said, if this is God, I'm not into it. This whole bit about if you do this, you're going to heaven. If you don't do that, you're going here. And if you do all these rules and regulations, so that doesn't sound like God to me. And through a course of events, and over a span of about six years, the Lord led me to get saved. But the result of that is I didn't grow up in the mainstream church. I didn't learn all of that stuff. In some ways, it's easier for me because I have to tell you there's a spirit of religion that can't exist in churches. And it's, it's one of the most detrimental things often that will impede you in your walk from getting to know the Lord better. If you want to know the Lord better, you've got to spend your time alone in the wilderness with Him. You know, I had an interesting talk with Mom Iris just before this gathering. And she was sharing with me that she did a retreat and in the beginning she would tell people to go and spend five minutes alone with the Lord and they didn't know how. And then it became 10. And then it became 15. Thank you for great material by the way. And she said eventually built it up so it was an hour. I can only imagine how much time Jesus spent alone with the Father in the wilderness. How much time John the Baptist spent alone with the Father in the wilderness. And the reason it's necessary is because God wants to reveal to you how he's coming again. That's what this is all about. He wants to reveal to you how he's coming again. You can't learn this. I can share about it. But I can't teach it to you. It's not, it's not an intellectual knowledge. You can study your Bible until you're blue in the face and never get this. Never see it. It has to be revealed. It has to be like the writer who wrote, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Public. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. The person who wrote that lyric had seen something. He had seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. With a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. He had seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. You know, I, I walked into a church once and 
I'd like to say I was surprised, but I was not surprised. That as, as I walked into this church, standing on, on a pillar on either side, there were two spiritual beings. And I looked at them and I said, those aren't angels, those are demons. And I said to the Lord, what are they doing here? And this was at the doorway to a church. And I walked in and I read their motto, serve, do this, do that. But there was nothing about seeking the presence of the Lord. There was nothing about the glory of the Lord. And the Lord said, and I said to the Lord, why are they there? And he said, that's your answer. He said, because the Holy Spirit isn't welcome here. What a sad, sad affair. That in some churches, the Holy Spirit is not welcome. I will say this, what we had this morning, is probably the most profound presence of the Lord that I have felt my entire lifetime. That just happened 15 minutes ago. There is definitely something happened. There's something happening to those that want to be and walk in the Spirit and want to experience His presence. You know, there's so many of us that want to heal. We want to walk on the water. We want to see this billion soul harvest. We want to see people not in pain anymore. Those things come as an outgrowth of the time that we spend with him in the wilderness. You don't get that kind of an anointing from reading your Bible. It doesn't matter how much money you give away. It doesn't matter how busy you keep yourself going to this church activity or that Christian thing. What matters is how, what is the depth of your relationship with Christ? It is out of that relationship that healings happen. I would, I would even say that the more time we spend alone with Him, the more we have to give to others. That's really the key. Mm-hmm. How much time do you spend in the wilderness? I spent 30 years in the wilderness. The fellowship that I was going to in my early 30s disbanded. Everybody went their own way. I spent 30 years in the wilderness. I spent a lot of time doing things that I should not have been doing. And, you know, the Lord is good. He loves us. He brought me back, as He always will. Because the thing is, once you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm convinced you can be sitting on a bar stool half drunk at midnight, and you'll be sharing Jesus with the person next to you. You just can't help it. It's in you. The Word is in you, and you just can't, you, you, it can't be undone. Your mind is going to be drawn to the Lord no matter what you do. Even more when you have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord, you can't unsee it. It envelops you. It becomes your obsession. It becomes all you think about. Even though it's unimaginable what all of that means. I can tell you that the Lord has been showing me things about the millennial reign I can't even share with you yet. One day I will. About what it will be like. And and what Sister Mary said was exactly right. While some people are getting ready to go, the Lord is preparing us to rule and reign with Him. You know, it says that the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth. And it says that the return of Jesus will be like the lightning going from the east to the west. We're not going to need a TV camera and a news crew to see it. And that's because... That's why Jesus said, if you hear that I've come to a mountain, go not hither, it's not me. But I will tell you that when Jesus is manifested in you, and in you, and in you, and in you, when Jesus is manifested in you, and thousands of people across this planet that have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord, this planet will be changed forever. Because you will light up like a light bulb, you will have a transfiguration moment, and all creation will see it together. 
That's what we're headed for. And we're right on the verge of it now. This won't happen to you I'm, by just studying your Bible. It won't happen to you just by going to church. Being a scribe or a Pharisee won't help, won't help you. But what will help you is spending time alone with Jesus in the wilderness. Thank God for those difficult times that he's put us through. I praise the Lord for the, for the incredible loneliness that I felt being a single Christian for year after year after year after year. Looking for fellowship of the Spirit, which I could not find. Until about three years ago when I walked in here and there was Cindy. This is a joke. With, is when I came in here and there was Cindy with her little hand who just went like this to call me up to pray with her. And I've been here ever since. There is nothing like the fellowship of the Spirit. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Luke 5.16, Jesus often slipped away from them and went into the wilderness to pray. Yes. Simeon and Anna waited their entire lives. And they were promised that they would see their salvation before they left this place. We have the promise of the coming of the glory of the Lord before we leave this place. He is preparing a people to rule and reign with him and in him. I am convinced that the struggles of this current time are not to be compared to the glory that the Lord is going to bring on this earth. Amen. Amen. I know that there's a lot of us that are out there trying to do good things. And the Bible says that faith without works is dead then the question is, what are the works that we should be doing? If all of my good works were as filthy rags, what are the works? If faith without works is dead, here and then over here, all of my good works are as filthy rags, what are the works? Well, it says Satan ro roams about the earth as a lion seeking whom he may devour. When you step up to Satan and say, you're not welcome here, get out. You have stopped the mouths of lions. That's a work of faith. It takes faith to do that. When you come against principalities and powers in high places and cast them down, that's a work of faith. When you stumble, and you will, and yet you declare, I'm righteous in the Lord. That's a work of faith. Because in my natural mind, I say to myself, you know, I know in my heart dwells no good thing. I know myself really well. I know the things I think. And Jesus comes to me and said, yes, but I've made you righteous. This isn't about your righteousness, it's about mine. The purpose of the Holy Spirit to a Christian is to convince you of your righteousness and your holiness. That takes a work of faith. So faith with works, without works is dead. But it's, it's not giving money to your local church. It's not how many hours you spend on your knees. It's not going in here and there and, here and, there and praying. The works of faith are the things that God calls you to that are supernatural that make an incredible difference in this planet. There is a prayerful people that is coming upon this planet and we're it. There is a big mess here that needs to be cleaned up. There's never been as much perversion on this earth as there is right now. And where evil does abound, so much more does grace abound. We are that light people. 
Jesus has purposed to reveal himself in you. People often wonder, what is my purpose? What has God called me to do? There's only one great hope, which is the high call of God in Christ Jesus. You may, be, you may have lesser calls, you may be a prophet, or you may have a gift of healing, but the high call of Christ, in Christ Jesus is that his spirit be fully formed in you, that you birth Christ, that you experience this transfiguration experience. That you have such a oneness for the Father that every word that comes out of your mouth, everything that you think is what the Father thinks. Every act that you do is what the Father tells you to do. This is what we are called to. And when we achieve that, and I believe that that's possible, because you have to believe it's possible, then you will be a teacher when you need to be a teacher. You'll be a preacher when you need to be a preacher. You'll be a healer when you need to be a healer. You'll be an evangelist when you need to be an evangelist. You'll be an apostle when you need to be an apostle. Because Jesus is beautiful for situation, and he's all of those things. Jesus is lacking nothing. And I'm fully convinced that when we become filled with all the fullness of God, that we also will be all of those things. There is a glorious time coming on the face of this earth. And now is the time for all of us to decide. Do we want to walk in the high call? Or do we just want to be a prophet? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Actually, me back up. He said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And yet, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. Revelation 3.21 To them that overcome, will I grant them to sit with me in my throne. Not beside the throne. Not in front of the throne. Not behind the throne. With me. And now, who can be in God's throne? Only God can be in God's throne. And yet, how is that possible? That we have this incredible promise. That where I am, there you may be also. Father, that they may be one as we are one. Me and you, you and me, we and they, they and us. What an incredible promise. Whatever you have thought for yourself, and I'm going to close. Because the Lord's telling me I'm done. I have one more thing to share. Whatever you have thought of yourself, the Lord has thought of you more. Whatever limitations you think you have, God doesn't see them. Some imagination that you've had about some supernatural thing that you're going to say or do, that was the word of the Lord. And that's going to happen. He doesn't give us these incredible visions or these incredible dreams for no reason. I had a dream last week. I was in a box. It kind of looked like I was in a little box. and It was vertical. It wasn't horizontal. And I was standing. And I stepped into it. It was mechanical in it. And it was a flying box. It had motors or wheels or fans on it or something. And I got into it. And I was cranking with my hands or pedaling with my feet. I don't remember. And I lifted it up off the ground. And I started hovering across the ground. And, I, and somebody else had one too. And I was following them. And I got maybe 100 or 200 yards away from where I started, and I suddenly realized, if I just let go, I kept flying. And I just kept hovering. And I was doing it through no effort of my own. And then in my mind, in the dream, I thought, this is great. I'm in the Spirit. I can just go right on up, right on up into heaven. Why not? And I just looked up, and I started to go up. And then I heard a loud voice say, No, you can't come up here yet. You have to... He, and the voice said, You can fly, but you have to stay here. Paul said, I have been in deaths oft. Which literally means, I've been dead often. I mean, he spent three nights in the deep before scuba gear. He got thrown to the beasts at Ephesus. 
He got thrown outside of the hit city and they bashed his brains out with stones. The Jews were really good at this, by the way. They'd been doing it for hundreds of years. They knew how. And he would get back up and walk on. And Paul's profession and his testimony was, to me to die is to gain Christ. He was ready to go. And he said, yet I stay here for you people. Did you know that we're you people? <laughs> It's very easy to talk about this and say, yes, but that was Jesus doing all this incredible stuff. But then you get to Paul and it becomes a whole lot harder because Paul was just like you and me. And Paul had, Paul had a recognition, the seven sons of Sceva. And they were trying to cast out demons and the demons spoke and said, Paul, I know. Jesus I know. Who are you? And that's because the demons who see much better in the spirit than we do, unfortunately, and it shouldn't be the case, by the way, looked at Paul and saw the same spirit on Paul that was on Jesus. There was no difference. It was exactly the same. Paul I know. Jesus I know. Who are you? Now he was really saying, the Christ I see on you, the anointing of Christ, and the Christ, the anointing of Christ I see on Paul, I see it on Jesus. And when the enemy sees the anointing of Christ on you, he will say, Paul I know, Jesus I know, you I know. When we're at that point, and actually we are at that point, that's what we're striving for. Put no limitations on yourself as to what God can do for you. I've known for 30 years my call for the body of Christ. It's very simple. Wherever they are, challenge them to go higher. That there is more. There's always more. How can there be less? We, have, we serve an infinite God. No matter what we have achieved, what we know, where we are in the Spirit, there's always more for us. I am convinced we will spend an eternity with the Lord and learn something new every single day. Oh, yes. I count myself as Paul that I have not achieved. I've seen great things and I know there's more for me to see. I'm not done yet. I'm not there yet. And I hope I never get there. Because I'll tell you, I have a short attention span. I get bored easy. <laughs> but with Jesus... I'm never bored. Morning by morning, new mercy I see. Amen. There is a place for you to live in revelation. So the next time you have this crazy imagination of yourself floating or walking on water or walking by people and you know, walking up, I've seen myself walking up and laying hands on a hospital and having everybody get up out of their beds and walk out the door. And greater works will you do if I go unto my Father. The day of the greater works is upon us. We're right at the doorway. So whatever you have, ask God for more. Yes. Now is the time to ask for more. Now is the time for you to set aside all of your preconceived notions of what you perceive God is and say, God, show me more of you. Amen. And get out into the wilderness with Him and let Him share incredible things with you. Because I can tell you, I'm not special. Paul's not special. Because God is no respecter of persons. We're all the same. And whatever the person is next to you, if that you're envious of their gifting, you can have it too. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. I don't know about you, but I've been praying for the gift of healing for some time now. And I am convinced that eventually God's going to give it to me if I keep asking. Now I may have to wrestle with him and he may pull my my hip out of its socket. But that's going to happen. It all, as is your faith, so be it unto you. What do you have faith for? What are you willing to ask God for? And what do you believe is possible for God to do through you? Because whatever you believe is possible, God can definitely do. Thank you, Jesus. Good.
Hallelujah. I can be done. I know. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Are Thank you done? You, Lord. I think so. All right. Um, the only thing I would say is maybe at some point we could pray if anybody wants more. We could pray for them to have more. Yes. Yes. We could. All right. I only have a few things. You almost covered the time beautifully. I think probably there are a couple of questions, but first of all, I want to say that his illustration in the beginning was excellent in terms of the, well, all of it was good, but the uh, learning to dwell in the wilderness was superb. And if you'll remember, God took Egypt into the wilderness. He didn't take them into the wilderness to starve or to lack or anything else. He took them into the wilderness so he could become intimate with them. He kept them into the wilderness so he could reveal himself to them. His sharing on Mount Sinai was sharing his own person to them. They didn't want it. They didn't want to listen to his voice. But in the wilderness, where we think of as wilderness, where we are alone, and where we're kind of feeling hemmed in because there's nothing for us to do. And I'm speaking as an older person here. This is very characteristic of people who no longer have the energy to do what they would like. Speaking personally. We were joking, I was joking with Mary and joking and we were rejoicing in her, her um, healing and uh, of course we both have houses that we manage and have to keep clean and I, can, I told her, I said as I get older my cleanness requirement and my neat requirement drops just a little but you can't see it that well anymore anyway. no you can't see it that well, you're so right I can only see it when I put my finger, oh I need to dust oh dear, but you, uh, you're correct but in the in, in the in the physical, when we get hemmed in, if we're not careful, we will think that's a punishment or think that we are no longer useful. Well, I'm not 25. Praise God. <laughs> I'm not 50 or even 70 or even 80 and beyond that. Not a lot, but a little. But the call on my life has not diminished, but increased. Yes. And I want you to hear me, everybody, whether you're young or old, the call on your life doesn't go away just because you may not be able to do five Bible classes in five different localities during the week. I actually did that in my 30s. And I look at it and go crazy. But you understand what I'm saying? We have a tendency in our wilderness to double think, triple think, personally suck our thumb, do a little bit of everything else. But the call in the wilderness, whether I'm young or whether I'm older, is to continue to hear God, just like Andy, Andrew was talking about, and move forward with him. Now I want to tell you, his lesson was a forward-working lesson. I wanted to tell you that the, that the call to rule and reign is actually in the book of Romans. And I can't remember where. But we're called to rule and reign with him. That's biblical. And the other thing that occurred in me is Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. I want to know Christ. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his suffering. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to read it because there's another phrase there. And somehow I don't recall it. And what? That's it. And be conformable. Well, let me read it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not as though as I've already done it, but I look forward and I press forward with everything in me. You see, the purpose that he outlined, the purpose for us, John 4, 17, we are as Christ in this world. Not we will be, we are. Yes. When I first realized that was in the Bible, I almost, I was stunned. Now, it's not that I haven't read it. I've read it many, many times. But when it, the light should, uh, shined on it, I realized, oh, not me, but you. No, he says not me, but you. I'm in you. And what the Lord has ahead for us is more than you've ever dreamed. More than you ever dreamed. And we need to be busy about the more. We don't need to be busy making sure all our ducks are in order so we can go up. Trust me, when we meet him in the air, which it says in Thessalonians, we will, it's going to be very different than anything you ever thought about, and that's not close as far as I can tell. Right. There are too many things that have to be done first. I give you one. Acts chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 17 was talking about the Lord Jesus. And Peter says, and he is in heaven. Our heaven must... It Again, I better read it. <laughs> this was another one that shocked me. And I have to deal with it. Acts. Not Corinthians. This book doesn't know to turn to Acts when I said Acts. It's not as easy as my. All right, we'll get there. Again, a verse I had not seen until the Lord shined his light, and it's all about that enlighten our eyes, which you mentioned when we were all up here together, that our eyes were from now on going to be enlightened to see things. All right, 317. That's not it. Um, there it is, 21. I'll read um, verse 17. He called upon the Jews present there, be repent, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom heaven must receive until the time of restitution or restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3, 21. So in that first gospel sermon, it was pronounced that the Lord would not come until all things were restored. That's what he meant by there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. And we're it. So instead of thinking of ourselves as less and powerless, Let's do what God called the Ecclesia to do. When he has said upon this rock, speaking of the revelation and the confession of Christ, he said upon this rock, I will build my Ecclesia. The word is not church. The word is Ecclesia. It means two different things. He's building a group of people. The word Ecclesia means... The first part of it, ek, is out of, and ecclesia is called by surname, called by name, called out. The born-again, spirit-filled body of believers are called out to become more than they've ever dreamed, to become that which hears God on the movement and moves. And that's what he was talking about. That's what he's learned to do. And the wilderness is a vital part of it. When, so when you find yourself without anything to do, take your Bible. You may need it. But get alone with the Spirit of God. Yes. 
and let him comfort you and let him remake you and let him treasure you and then step into what he says become and you are I can't encourage you any further I was wonderful thank you our brother I so appreciate you thank you for sharing this time of unfolding the word we welcome your questions and comments about this program either by mail at Psalm 19 Ministries 6138 South Salina Street Syracuse New York 13205 or by email at Psalm19Ministries at gmail.com. More information can be found by visiting Facebook or our website at Psalm19.org. Again, thank you for watching Unfolding the Word.